Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their temples, at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, our Lord, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now you know where I got that from, Psalm 19. <laughs> <laughs> so today's gospel starts with a famous scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is, the Gospel of John starts at a cosmic level and then goes on to introduce the human Jesus through the work of John the Baptist. In this narrative, John's community comes to know him right away as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the coming one, the Lord and the Son of God. John Balch, the author of Introduction to the New Testament, reminds us that a key point for entering into this narrative as well is that Jesus' first spoken words in the Gospel of John are, what are you looking for? He has come into the world as a savior, but that is his first question. In addition, being written 30 years later than the other Gospels, in about 100 AD, John's community looks beyond the synagogue with a mission to call all God's beloved creatures, but who are not Jews looking for a Messiah per se, as in the synoptics. By the way, when I say synoptics, I'm referring to the other three Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, because uh, the word synoptics comes from synthesis, since those three Gospels have a lot of common sources and also their own unique uh, you know, um, words. So that's why we say it's a th- synthesis for those three Gospels. But John really stands out. has totally different sources. So how does one preach Christ to those who are not looking for a Messiah? Can we just begin where they are, so to speak? If our ultimate hopes are expressed in terms of universal human longing, the Jesus of the Gospel of John will identify himself as the way, the truth, and the life, the source of true light, the bread and the water. In Jesus, the one true God comes seeking true worshipers who acknowledge God as their God. As it says in John John 4, 24, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Another way of saying this is, God is sheer being itself. Those who worship must do so out of their very being, their authentic selves. And so what is living in the spirit and in truth? Well, let's explore that idea and we'll talk about it again at the end. So unlike the synoptics who placed this event of the cleansing of the temple, after the triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, right at the beginning of Holy Week, John places it at the beginning of his ministry. So for Mark, Matthew, and Luke, the public expression of rage that Jesus makes about corruption in the temple was one of the catalysts for his crucifixion at the end of that same week. But for John, 
It's a statement of what was important to Jesus and who Jesus was right at the beginning of his gospel. The synoptics use the term den of robbers or den of thieves for what was going on, but in John the term is marketplace or business. The system of buying animals for sacrifice was corrupt because people who could not afford it were overcharged. John's statement that the temple was becoming a place of business kind of takes the sting out of the message compared to the synoptics. In all four Gospels, though, is the message that the sacrificial system that has, that, that, that has been that motive. So, in John, Jesus wants those who follow him in spirit and truth to respond instead to the imperative we read in Micah 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted gods? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With the Lord, with the, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. So what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So that's the message of the cleansing of the temple. One is a step. Um, Dr. Harold Attridge of Yale Divinity School starts a lecture on the Gospel of John with two paintings. One is a statue of a Roman leader like Caesar holding an orb or a ball and a scepter, one in each hand. The orb represents the world and the scepter represents military victory. So the image depicts Roman victory over the world in its quest for imperialism. Jesus, on the other hand, is depicted holding one hand in a gesture of blessing and holding a Bible with the other hand. He is at one with the book because he is the book, because he is the word. What a startling contrast, two completely different worldviews. These two paintings represented the idea that Paul conveys in the New Testament lesson from Corinthians. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Somewhere in all of this is the answer to the question for each of us, what are you looking for? Another important distinction between the synoptics and John is that only John includes the metaphor of the temple destruction and rebuilding. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He, of course, was speaking of the temple of his body. After he, raised, he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So this passage is not only a critique about the use of the temple for anything other than worship, it was also, and maybe more importantly, that the temple is not a building at all. It is Jesus. He is angry about any human construction that creates a barrier between God and justice for all people. Jesus as temple moved about his world free from institutional walls. We too can and must be present to those outside the building of the church wherever we are, wherever we go. Our way of being as those who listen to the word, who can perhaps walk calmly through storms and share God's foolishness that is wiser than human wisdom will be the thing that helps someone answer that question, what are you looking for? We can choose to move beyond the mental and physical and social constructions that frame us and find connections in our communities creatively. Scholar and author John Dominic Crossan makes another intriguing point. The people of Israel were waiting for a Messiah, that is, waiting for God to come down and bring in his kingdom on earth. They thought he was going to intervene and bring justice for all, maybe even in, his, in their lifetime, and that we were to be prepared and to pray and to hope. And that was heralded in John the Baptist's ministry. But Jesus realized that God's plan was that of a collaborative eschatology. This means that God is waiting for us, not the other way around, to take part in a mutual effort to bring in God's kingdom. In Jesus' time, he witnessed the Romanization of his homeland, the commercialization of the Sea of Galilee, and on a smaller scale than we talk about it now, globalization. He saw and was sensitive to the economic gaps before anyone, and therefore he renews the Old Testament imperative of Micah 6, which we read before, of prioritizing the poor, and of those who have the least in any sense of the word. So Jesus also harks back to Isaiah 61, 
staking out his claim as the one anointed who will show us the way. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. As we are learning in our Wednesday night food and formation class about the Beatitudes and St. Francis, those who live in poverty have the hope and expectation in a God who will provide. And through Jesus, we hear the message that God is a collaborative God who needs us to be the eyes and ears and hands and feet of our Lord in this world. Working through us, God can serve the poor. Therefore, when we read, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we see both those who lack earthly necessities and those who can help provide these things in a sacred dynamic. That gives us all the joy of understanding that God's kingdom on earth and what it looks like. The children of God as givers and the receivers, functioning in the spirit and truth of bringing the gospel imperative into reality, which is life-giving for both parties. So now I just want to take a little, you know, what's the word, tangent, and talk about anger. <coughs> so, is it a sin? What is righteous anger? Harriet Lerner, who wrote a The Dance of Anger, tells us that anger is an, an important emotion, and it can be a vehicle for positive change. It can help us define who we are and help us find our authentic self. And generally, if we don't use it, we usually misuse it. Of course, no one should act out of anger and be hurtful, scheming, deceitful, or destructive. On the other extreme, not expressing anger can turn into depression or an occasional unplanned outburst. In such a case, that even if we're right, nobody's going to listen. <laughs> so, we, if, but if we give in and go on, and if we avoid conflict, we are not making a clear statement of who we are. So what about the situation in today's gospel? Jesus' anger was not only a personal statement that, he, that tells us about his priorities, it is a statement about necessary change on the collective level. Jesus' anger is energized by his righteous critique. So in modern times, we see Gandhi, who was angry about English imperialism in India, and Martin Luther King Jr., who was angry about racial injustice. They both made their points peacefully, but their anger fueled their strategies and goals for major social reform. I think St. Augustine said it well. He referred to today's gospel story and correcting behavior in general when he said, stop those whom you can, restrain whom you can, frighten whom you can, I don't know about that one, allure gently whom you can, and do not, however, rest silent. So when Jesus asked each of us, what are you looking for? Let's look at the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Aren't we all really looking for how to be poor in spirit? How to live the joy that St. Francis exemplified? Someone who knew the rewards of being focused more on being than on having. Ancient church father Origen said, let us understand that the temple in today's gospel is the soul of a person freed from earthly things, thanks to Jesus. We too are temples in the making. May we each continue to discern our place on the continuum between the world of Caesar and the word who is Jesus. It is a lifelong quest. It is the journey of those living in spirit and in truth. Amen.
invite the congregation to stand as you are able. Together, let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. God of love, we pray for you. God of love, we pray for your church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, for all lay and ordained ministers, for all who seek you in the community of the faithful. Equip us with compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. God of love, Hear our prayers for the church. God, God of freedom, we pray for our nation and all the nations of the world, for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed, for elected and appointed leaders, that they may serve the common good. Inspire all people with courage to speak out against hatred, to actively resist evil. Unite the human family in bonds of love. God of freedom. God of justice, we pray for the earth, your creation entrusted to our care for the animals and birds, the mountains and oceans, and all parts of your creation that have no voice of their own. Stir in us a thirst for justice that protects the earth and all its resources, that we may leave to our children's children the legacy of beauty and abundance that you have given us, God of justice. God of peace, we pray for this community, for our local leaders, for our schools and markets, for our neighborhoods and workplaces, for our partners in outreach and mission. Kindle in every heart a desire for equality, respect, and opportunity for all. Give us courage to strive for justice and peace among all people, beginning here at home. God of peace. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need or trouble, for those whose lives are closely linked with ours, and those connected to us as part of the human family, for refugees and prisoners, for the sick and suffering, the lonely and despairing for those facing violence, for all held down by prejudice and injustice. Awaken in us compassion and humility of spirit as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. On this day, we especially pray for Sandy Armstrong, 
the Brown family, Brian Grimsley, Tim Mowry, Ron Chita, Bruce Fisher, Donna, John, D. Holland Brock, and Melita Holland, Lou Stack, Madeline Sell, Christine Dragu, Quincy Daniel, Beverly Beck, and those who lift, lift up at this time. God of mercy. Hear our prayers for all of our need. God of grace, we pray for those who have died, for the faithful in every generation who have worked for justice, for prophets who called us to radical reconciliation, for martyrs who died before because of hatred for all the communion of saints. Make us faithful to your call to proclaim your good news by word and example, and bring us at last into the glorious company of the saints in, the, in light. On this day, we pray especially for Ruth Charlotte, Charlotte Brown, Lavon Falconer, Troy Brown, Ruby Ziegler, and those we list at this time. God of grace, hear our prayers for those who have died. Hear our prayers, holy God. Breathe your spirit over all of us and all the earth, that the barriers would crumble and division cease. Make us more fully your co-healers of the broken world. Unite us with all people in bonds of love, that the whole earth and all its peoples may be at peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My sisters, my brothers, my friends in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.